Oh yeah, when's Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one minute to go, but I'm going to stop it. If you don't mind, Jeff will come in. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> Rule number one for us meeting. We want to have fun. I want to see some smiles. I'd like to see some interaction, but stop it. Off. I want to say, just looking around, you guys look really great. Look professional, you look really good. Has anybody got any feedback from the customers? Or has anybody said anything to you guys about your uniform? Yeah, I look like a postman. That's better than looking at postman. I don't know what they used to say about you. <laughs> well, then let me be the first to tell you. You guys look real professional. You should be proud of what you're wearing. You look like you know what you're doing. Perception is everything. Right? <laughs> But from wearing those uniforms. <clears throat> One year ago, or about August, I stood in front of you guys and I introduced the top five board. And if you recall, I said the reason why we were starting into a program with Alini was because we wanted to wow the customer. And if we do that, a lot of good things come from that. A lot of good things like you'd like to come to work now. The crowd, it's a great place to work. The customers are really interacting with you and you're also able to make more money to bring home and serve your family as well by doing that. We've been working on the uh, customizing and operating power. Those are the chapters that we've been doing. Chapter 7, Chapter 8, Chapter 9. That's the chapter 7 tells you what to do from the moment you get in in the morning to the eat. And then the other chapters, the eating and children, tell you how to service the eating, cooling things, and plumbing the victory way. Right? So I encourage you guys to look through those chapters Read them. I'm not asking you to memorize them, but understand what's in them because uh, that's going to really help you towards uh, working the French the uh, program. Uh, and today we are to talk about reward the right stuff. And we have a special guest here today that's going to help us with that. And this is what we're building on top of each other uh, to make things happen so that it works in the right way. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? I'm going to try to, I don't know how to make this interactive, but any questions about what we've, we've done so far in the program? Okay. Uh, what we're doing is we're building up systems and, and uh, chapters, manuals. You're, stand, you're sitting right in what's going to be our future lab. Great stuff. We've got a table set up here. We're going to have a video going on. And we're going to do some actual training. And then right behind you is equipment that we're going to be setting up so that you can actually work on the equipment. Right, so training is, is going to be a big part of what we're doing, and that's going to be uh, make you guys better mechanics and better skills of what you're doing. Um, we're, we're giving you guys the tools and the, uh, the environment and the ability to be the best that you can be, to use your God-given talents to the maximum. And, and that's going to really allow you to be uh, very productive, very good at what you do, and also serve your family very well by making more money. So, uh, it's an exciting thing. All I ask from you, I, I, the only thing I can't do is you've got to bring yourself to the game. You guys have to have a willingness, a want to, to be here. You have to have a want to to try this out. You have to have an open mind, and you have to want to try to get better. If you do that, I'll go 110% to help you do that. But you just have to have that want to. You, with the want to and what we're providing for the systems and the program we have, this is going to be wonderful. Already, a lot of good things have come from it. The uniforms that you're wearing, the training that we're doing. Um, this, I, I made a list of it yesterday. It's like 50 different things. The CSIs are now split up from the DSIs. And customer calls are coming in better. We're doing that a lot better. I think you guys are, are hearing good, better things from your customers. You're hearing good reports. And, and uh, it's going to get better and better. So it's a lot of, a lot of positive things that have come from the program and a lot of positive things will continue to go and we still get a ways to go on the program. Uh, that's going to even make it better. So uh, I guess that's all I want to say. Is there anything I'm missing, Ellen, that I'm <coughs> bringing up? Rockin'. Rockin' awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, that's it. Mike, do you want to take it over? Sure. Yay. Thank you. Sorry. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. 
know you didn't really have any mics. <laughs> <laughs> um, they gave me five minutes today to talk. So I'm going to do my best to keep it under ten. <laughs> um, well, seriously, uh, we only have about an hour, so we're going to do the best we can to try to explain to you our sincerest vision, where we're going, a little bit about where we've been, why we're doing this. Um, and all we ask is that you give us uh, your attention. And we'll try to keep it as far as possible. Um, a little bit of reminiscing, I'll keep this really short because it gets really boring for an old man to get up here and do that. But, you know, ironically, it's been almost 20 years. Um, it is, in fact, this year, when Dave and I had the vision of saying, well, let's start a company called Victory. And we started our business plan. We had, we had left our previous employer and we were taking six months of jobs with uh, Johnson Controls. And even though we didn't incorporate it until 1993, the vision started in 92. Now the unique thing about 1992 and 2012 is the economy was almost in exactly the same situation it is right now. Uh, back in 1989 and uh, 90, the economy went into a tailspin. And even though it was the worst I had ever seen, uh, it wasn't close to as bad as this one has been. But it was still pretty bad. It was bad enough that when I was driving to work every day, I would see backhoes and front end loaders and heavy equipment for sale everywhere. Uh, housing developments that had, had started were shut down and mothballed. Um, I'll never forget driving by Medway Block on Route 109, which you guys probably, some of you still know. They closed their doors for the three years of that recession because they just couldn't even run. And then they reopened and the economy picked up. Now they've been around long enough to be able to do that. Maybe all their properties were paid off and it was family and they all went on a vacation. I don't know. But it was ugly. It was really bad. And when Dave and I were working, the two vice presidents of the company let go. The entire company took a 10% pay cut and layoffs were probably 20% across the board. It was very, very ugly. Uh, but they managed, they pulled through, and uh, that started between 89 and 90, and it lasted right up until 1992. And in 1992, when things were at rock bottom, and Dave and I figured, well, you know, everybody's saying that the economy's going to get better. It can only improve from here. Maybe 1993 is the time for us to start our business. If we can make it then, we can probably make it through anything. So the timing was good. We had a lot of things going for us. We, we knew a lot of people. We had started hands-on. We knew how to pull the wrenches. We knew how to put up tin. We knew how to service. We had been to school for engineering. We had been to school for management. We had done it all. We were both pushing 40, and we said, hey, you know, we're going to do this for the rest of our lives, or we're going to try to you know, do something that we always dreamed of doing. So, so we made that leap. We were really excited. We were all pumped up, and we were very, very blessed. We had some really good success. Year one, which wasn't a full year because it was like in the middle of 1993 when we incorporated, it was like 300,000 in sales. But we grew at a million dollars a year for 10 years. And in 10 years, we were doing 10 million bucks. And it was profitable every year. We were proud, we thought it was great, and we were still all pumped. Now, that's 10 years ago. Here we are, almost approaching our 20th year. And we just went through economy, uh, an economic downturn, much more severe than the previous one. It's global. It's all around the world. And it's bad. And it's crippled with many other things going on. Wars and, uh, and no money. The government spent all the money. And a deficit that's beyond belief. So, I mean, it's not like this thing's going to just, you know, leapfrog out of its particular situation it's in, and that in six months or a year we're all going to be back to normal. That's not going to happen. So, you know, what a lot of companies do, and, 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 and it's the first thing that comes to your mind when you're running a business, well, what can we do to ride this thing out? We're going to lay off a whole bunch of people, we're going to get pay cuts, we're going to lower our prices so that we can keep getting work, once you do that, and you're already at a tight margin, then you lose losing money. And you know what? You can only do that for so long. 
Well, even though that all crossed our minds and, and we're washing our pennies, we decided that we've got, a, we've got 20 years invested in this company. What's the best thing to do except maybe invest more into it? <coughs> so we're going the other direction. We've got this really good company with really good employees and really loyal customers. And we've got a great reputation. All we need is for the phone to ring more and to bring in more sales so that we can continue to grow and make profit. So Dave came to me about a year ago with a vision. He says to me, well, Mike, you know, we can, we can, we can eventually retire from this company. I'm not sure when that will be, but someday, because if we don't, they're going to throw us out of here. Um, but, you know, I mean, someday, um, this company is, our vision, our dream is that it's going to continue to run in our absence. And hopefully all of you stay in the family that we're in now. Now, when I talk about this company, I, I, I don't like to refer to it as our company. This is your company as much as it is, it is Dave's and mine. We write the bills. Uh, we take on the liability, uh, and we manage it the best way we can. But if you think about it, this is where you guys come every day. <coughs> you spend more time here than you do with your families. You're here five days a week. You're eight hours a day, plus your travel time. So it's a big, big part of your life. And wherever you work, I'm a big advocate of this. If you don't like what you're doing, you should change your career, no matter what they pay you. Um, you need to be adequately compensated for what you do, but you've got to like what you're doing. Now, well, just a little while ago I said, we had good employees, we have a good company. <coughs> well, guess what? We're not the only ones out there that are good. There are other companies that are good. Some not so good. And we can continue being good. And if we're good tomorrow, we're going to be the same company tomorrow we are today. The same struggles we have tomorrow that we have today. And we have those struggles. We have those struggles of where are we going to get the next job, how are we going to keep the backlog up, how are we going to collect the money, how are we going to pay the bills, what are we going to do about pay raises, what are we going to do about the insurance costs that just went up, what are we going to do about what this top mod rate that just went up because we've had so many injuries. And on and on it goes. And the competition gets brutal. Unemployment, as we all know, is hovering around 8 or 9%. That may not sound so bad because they're saying, well, it's getting better. Well, guess what? The construction industry is 18%. More than double the rest of the sectors. And a good part of what we do is construction. And even if it's not, even if it's service, guess what again? All the companies that only did construction work and only did the big new jobs are all fighting for the little jobs and the service work. So now they're in our backyards. And what does that do? It drives down prices. So, Dave came to me and said, well, what are you going to do? How are we going to fix this? And his answer was, well, let's invest in our company. Let's not worry about cutting back. Let's invest. Let's invest in our people. Let's not sell for good. Let's make us the best that we can be. And you know, it really made me think because first 10 years that we were in this business and we grew at that, at that rate of speed, and we had all that excitement, that was our vision. We didn't want to settle for being good. We wanted to be the best. And, and, and we felt that way every day. Anytime we were introduced to somebody on the street, and they said, oh, Victory, I know you guys. In fact, they had you at my house. We'd perk right up and say, hey, that's great. It was a good experience. You know, did it work well? Or did it, you know, we actually were sure it would have been. And guess what it was? And if we were doing a big commercial project, <coughs> we would tell everybody, look, maybe everybody is, is the electricians and the plumbers and everybody go in and they do their work and at the end of the day they pick up and they leave. And, and, and all the, all the sozol that they did and the whole mm -hmm. building they did and all the stuff that the, the, the wire and the pipe is all left on the floor. 
and they don't, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to clean up. We're going to look different to that general contractor, to that end user, than everybody else. We're going to wear the booties when we go into somebody's house. We're going to be polite. We're going we're to be courteous. We're going to educate the consumer. We're going to talk to them all about the things that they need to hear. We're going to make their experience a good experience. Actually, I just said that word again, good. We're going to make a great experience. Because good has almost become common nowadays. Everybody already expects good. Well, good doesn't get you the referral. <clears throat> good just makes you acceptable. When we grew in the first 10 years of this business, we didn't spend a lot of money advertising. And we didn't knock on a lot of doors. You know what we grew from? Referrals. We made sure that every customer that we did business with, or I don't care if it was a residence or a big commercial job, at the end of the job, they felt that they got more than they paid for. It didn't matter what they paid. It didn't matter what we charged. At the end of the day, they felt like they got a really, really good value. Now, some of you guys have had the luxury of working for customers who show their appreciation. They bake you cookies, or they cook you muffins, or they give you coffee. And you know what? <laughs> we find those stories rare, and, but they're funny. But you know what it does? It makes you, it makes you leave at the end of the day saying, wow, that customer was thrilled by what we just did. Dave and I had that vision for the first 10 years of this company when we were trying to run everything, to do that with every client. And sometimes it, it blew the budget. But we were going to do one thing, and we were going to do it right. We were going to make sure that they felt that, that what they got was a great value. So, I am way over my five minutes. <laughs> and I apologize for that, but you guys all expected that already. So I just want to say this. Uh, I applaud Dave for his idea and his vision. I think, um, I think investing, in, in, and when I say investing, the managers in this company, combined with Dave, have been putting in countless hours and energy to build these manuals. These manuals aren't something that we're just dumping on you and saying, hey, here's a nice piece of paper, throw it in your truck, and once in a while you might refer to it. This is going to be the culture of our company. It's only the start, it's the tip of the iceberg. The investment we're making to build all of that stuff, to get the measuring sticks in place so that we can not only train you guys to be the best at what you can be, but we're going to measure your performance so that anywhere that you're not doing your best, we can fix it and make you better. Because as you guys get better at what you're doing, our customers are going to get a much better product. They're going to get a much better service. They're going to get a much, much better job. And the salespeople will get much better margins. And everybody wins. Okay? So, I don't want to waste too much more time. We have a wonderful lady with us here today. Um, she packs a a really big punch, <laughs> and she comes with uh, a tremendous amount of experience in our industry. Uh, she's the former president of Ben Franklin Plumbing, it's a franchise um, that she ran for several years uh, that had 40, 47. 47 branches when she left, they're now up to 200. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to introduce her. Her name is Ellen Raw. <laughs> Thank It is an honor to be here. I've had an absolute blast. There's something about this area, and I think this shop in particular, you guys are kind and funny and friendly, and I have really enjoyed my work here. Now, today, uh, the topic of our conversation is what a program we call the Re Reward the Right Stuff program. And between now and the bottom of the hour, our intention is to introduce you to this program, give you an idea of what's to come. It's going to be kind of uh, wild and woolly, perhaps, for a little bit while we, we get it rolled out. But the, the commitment that we've got from, from Dave and Mike and Todd and the, and the branch managers is, is very exciting to me. I want to share a little bit of my history. So you know a little bit of my prejudices and my philosophy as we roll this program out. The details, we may, you know, we'll figure out the details. You guys will absolutely figure out the details. But the overall philosophy, I want you to understand, you know, what 
um, the design of the program is what it's based on. Um, as you know, can probably tell, I'm a, a plumber with a lot of experience with hydraulics and solar. If the fairy channel locks, I would get hurt. I don't do any of this. I'm the wife of a plumber, and I will tell you there's something about a man who works with his hands that I really like. A woman agrees. What a guy. Go easy, Go easy, guys. No, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, and it, it, is, it is with that that I share, I am deeply respectful and, honor, and honoring of technicians. Uh, you know, the, I was somebody growing up that we called people. I thought when he flushed the toilet, it was a miracle. I thought it just disappeared. Right? Indoor weather. I thought that was like a, a God-given right. You know, electricity. Now I realize it's, it, it's lightning wrangling. You know, the more I learned about it, I married a plumber and I started to figure out this plumbing thing. And you know what? It is a miracle. What you guys do is amazing. And so I have this just deep underlying respect that you deserve to make a great living doing what you do. All right? Because people like me can't do it themselves. So thank you for that. All right? So I married my husband, the plumber, and his partner dies. At age 33, they got a, a business going like this to these two. One of them works himself into a total health crisis and punches out at 33 years old. All right? So there's my husband. He says, you know what? I, I don't really like the business part of business. I just like the technical work. Right? He loves it. And my husband's hot rod. Did anybody know my husband's hot rod more? That's, that's him. Okay. And uh, so I said, no, no, no. I got a great idea. I'll quit my real job with benefits and, and a vacation and somebody to cover for me, and I'll come work for you. It'll be great. You turn wrenches, I count the money, we'll get rich. Well, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we didn't make any money, and we didn't have any fun. And luckily, I found a mentor. I saw him in the pages of a magazine, Plumbing and Mechanical. I uh, wrote him a letter on some cheesy, cheap stationery, and I asked him to help me. And I spent two pages telling him why, but I can't raise my prices, and you don't understand how cheap my customers, and all this whiny stuff of why, what if he was suggesting in that article, of course, wouldn't work for me and my company. So he calls me up, calls his columnist, calls me up, and tells me I have my head stuck in a very dark place. On the phone, this guy calls me up and tells me that. And I was initially offended and then humbled. And I took him up on his offer to help me, and he set me on the path that I'm on today, which is a very, very good path, which is that you deserve to make a great living doing what you do, what you and your husband do. And as he taught me my asset from my elbow, how to keep score, how to keep track, we raised our prices, scared the you-know-what out of us, and we started to make more money, and life got a lot better. Now, my husband and I, though, we fought and we worked together. Can you imagine that? Okay. And the reason why, once we was solved the initial financial crisis that was going on in our company, what was torturing us is that we didn't have the same idea of our business. Okay? That I thought, wow, this is getting pretty fun. Maybe we could grow this thing. And my husband was thinking, I like working all by myself. Now, who do you think was right in that situation? We know who runs your household, Tony. <laughs> That's a big man. <laughs> Smart man. The answer is, it does, it, there's no wrong in any of this. The owner of the company, the owners of the company, are responsible for clarifying the vision. What does this company look like? What are we going to be? What are we going to stand for? You know, what, do we want to grow? Do we want to do HVAC and plumbing? You know, what are the choices? That's the owner's job. That's the one thing that they cannot delegate. What is this thing? Where are we going? This is a point on the horizon. And if you have a difference of opinion, you got to get on the same page. And in our case, we didn't. So we decided not to work together. And I'm proud to say that we're still married, or at least I was when I left. So <laughs> when I get back. You know, it's always the day of the time. But um, the, the, the idea is that um, when I left then, I had this opportunity that what, what, how can I serve? What, what now, with my experience, strength and hope, how can I be of service? Well, I was absolutely obsessed with 
the, the understanding that I had gained about how to make money. It's really simple, and if, if you want, if you're taking notes, jot this down. You've got to charge more than it costs. <laughs> okay, that wraps up Ethan up. Thank you very much. <laughs> you gotta charge more than it costs. But if you're not keeping score and some of the guys in your neighborhood, they, they aren't. So they can keep lowering their prices. You get that? They can keep living in oh yeah, come, oh fellas, we saved you, so yeah, we saved you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Sorry, the Alan. Sorry, Alan. No, no, that's good. I'm glad you have a spot. <clears throat> so um Anyway, I got, I, I, I got I this idea that I could help other mom and pop shops and uh, help them make more money, have more fun, and that's what I did. And along the way, I got approached by a group of venture capitalists, and they said, would you like to start the world's largest plumbing company? And I said, sure. <laughs> and I went to the store, I bought franchising for dummies. I made a lot of mistakes. And, but what I learned is this, and this is really important. I'm sharing this so you can kind of understand after I leave like, what some of the... The, 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 the core philosophy of this program we're about to lay out on. The simpler you make a system, the bigger we can take it. The easier it's going to be. And certainly when it comes to the accounting, the scorekeeping, the financial systems, we want to make it so simple that the systems don't get in the way of you guys going out there and serving customers. They're supposed to support you, not distract you. All right, do you get this? Charge more than it costs, come up with a good selling price, and then enable you guys to be so good at what you do, so technically competent, that, that your customers go, oh, it's expensive, but it's worth it. That's what we're looking for. It's expensive, but it's worth it to have you come and help me out of the way. All right, so since then, <coughs> I left Benjamin Franklin a few years ago, and I went back into the consulting business. But I'll tell you, I am obsessed with employee opportunity, obsessed with it. Because in every case, when I go to a company, this is what I do, I get a pretty easy job. I listen to the problem and I say, you know who can fix this? The people at your company. Because they know more than us in the conference room who are trying to figure this out. So why don't we go spend some time with them? Why don't we hang out with them? Because when I became the president of Benjamin Franklin, knowing as much as I do about plumbing, <laughs> imagine me walking into the shop and saying, we're going to take daddy's name off the truck put Benjamin Franklin on it, and there's a new sheriff in town. Okay? Imagine how well that was received in the places where I went. So what I did, because I didn't know any better, was I thought, well, I'll put on the costume, and I'll get in the truck with you guys, and I'll ride along. And what I learned is a lot of times the stuff that we did in the office was getting in the way. I put in this DVD, you got 16 forms to sign before we can even talk. Uh, you know, you're doing all this stuff, and it's getting in the way of the relationship of you and Mrs. Furman, right? So I, that's where I got my strength. That's where the experience that I have is going to be of service to you. That if, I, if what we put together helps you do your job and helps you be rewarded in such a way that it makes sense to you, we've done a good job with this program. So that's a little bit about my history um, and my prejudices. I also know, one more thing I want to say. No, I'm going to wait. Okay. I'm going to tell you what we've done so far to help gear up for this program to work the right stuff. I came back, I came here, was it a year ago? Like, when was I here the first time? A while ago. A while, a long while ago. Time. See, we're all old. We need some young people here. <laughs> Should be more of us. All right. So I came a while ago and I got to meet uh, Miss Deb, who is arguably one of the best controllers I've ever met on the planet, right? <laughs> And her fine team, our intention, and it's still our intention, is to keep streamlining these systems. You know, I'm encouraging you, if there's something, we do it here, we do it here and here, <coughs> and we not do it three times, right? That's our overall, you know, can we streamline, can we simplify, and you guys have done a rocking job, and I want you to continue that dialogue of how simple we can make the system so that we can keep scoring. And we wanted to empower Todd and the managers and the team to know to know what you have for sales and expenses every week. Not wait till two weeks after the month is closed, right? To know right now, how are we doing, right? Let me just take a guess. Are there any sports fans in the group? <laughs> is anybody watching Mar Ma March Madness? Is anybody into that? Yeah, right? And you know, of course, the Super Bowl and all these games. Could you imagine if we told those groups of professionals or even amateur athletes, we're not gonna keep score because we don't want anybody to feel bad. <laughs> right? You keep score. You play the game. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you keep score. 
And so at a global level, we start at the overall business, sales, labor expenses, material, overhead. We gotta charge more than it costs. The whole thing has to work. The house has to win first for anybody to have a job, right? So we've gotta protect, protect that piece of it. And then, the intention has always been, since these guys pulled me along with Al, I work with Al a lot. How many of you met Al? Uncle Al. All right. <laughs> Uncle Al's the one who's idea, you know, who introduced the idea of this training oh, center. How many of you think that's a rock and go? <laughs> right. Okay. This, this is, this is going to be the best I've ever seen. But you've got it set up already the best I've ever seen. Okay, so um, uh, we have to do that first. Now, if we, we see where we are, the next step is, well, where do you want to be? And guess whose job that is? Theirs. What do we set for a budget? They get to choose. And, we, and we're up there doing really sophisticated things like, I don't know, what do you think, 10 million? Uh, well, let's make it 12 million. You know, you get to choose how much you want for your goal. But that becomes the overall game to play. All right, that's the Super Bowl, or that's the championship, or whatever, that, that's the goal that we pick. But that's their job to pick that. Okay, so then if we have that goal, we have all of you who are actually going to make that happen. Anybody who stands in front of Mrs. Fernwicky, all right, what's your name? Josh, I got I've been so by from you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sometimes you're going to produce, you know, do your own work as a service tech, and sometimes as an installer, you're going to make good on the promises that the that the salespeople make, right? So now we put a budget together, and we're up there scratching our heads. The next logical thing, in my opinion, is well, why don't we go take score and see what our benchmark is for what we're already producing individually, and from the salesperson's standpoint, and then why don't we also keep score as far as job costing goes. Now here's some good news. Deb and you are doing a rocking job of job costing. Let me ask this of the install as the install crew. As installers, how many of you would like to know how many hours the salespeople put in the job so that you could bring the job in on time? How many of you would find that interesting information? <laughs> right? I mean, yay. Okay, and Dave's both hands are up, and I saw you pulled up the, the sticker off the back of that. I wouldn't ask Dave to be on your install team, I'm just saying. Oh. <laughs> you think you're bad with channel yeah, No, I You should see me. We're going to get hurt out there. All right, so what we're going to do is we kick off the Reward the Right Stuff program. What we intend to do is put in a sound, simple, hopefully transparent, at some point transparent program, where you as someone who comes to work at the company knows how much you're going to get paid, what it's going to take to move to the next level, and what kind of reward is available should you go above and beyond. How many of you think that that basic philosophy is a good idea? All right. Okay, now the execution is where we're going to go next. So what we're going to do is demonstrate some of the forms. Let me see what I have for time here. Okay, good. About a half hour. Okay. So um let's talk about the uh, let's talk about scorekeeping in general first. So we've got this idea of what we want for the company. The next phase is so let's let's find a baseline. Let's see where we are currently operating for sales and for production. 
So we're going to keep um, score. So where I am on the uh, agenda is KFP means a known financial position. That means we've got to get to a place where we know what's going on in a current way. Um, an FQC is our financial quick check. That's the scorecard that the managers look at. They're keeping score on a global level once a week. The budget is now, where do we want to go? What do we want to have happen? And it's up to the, the chiefs to decide that. And now we're going to talk about the individual scorecards and how we're going to roll this program out. So the goals come from the budget. The idea is to give you guys a clear expectation at every level of the company of what you're to do. Now the manuals are a huge start along those lines. Pretty much the manuals are this is what you're supposed to do. In the office and in the field. How nice that is to know that this is, okay, if this is your manual, this is what you're supposed to do right in there. Okay? Um, we've created an overall organizational chart. How many of you have seen the organizational chart? The organizational chart shows you to whom you report. That's a useful thing, right? And it also, this is exciting, should show you the ladder of opportunity. What other jobs are out there? Where can I go in this company? You know, what does it take to go from apprentice to junior tech to senior tech to master tech, right, to branch manager? Where do I go from there? All right, so the, the, the organizational chart should be aligned with some clear expectation of what it takes to get from one level to the next. So if we're going to help you do that, we're going to keep score here. If we're going to train you and not keep score, that's not very smart, right? Because if we train you, how do we know that you're getting any better if we don't keep some kind of score? <laughs> and if we're going to put scorecards on the wall, these are some samples, if we're going to keep score and not train you, that's mean. That's mean. For week after week, for you to not be doing well in your position and nobody give a brother a hand, right? That's not fair. So as we set up training, you have to do tracking and scorekeeping. The two always go together. Is that making sense? All right. So we want to be able to grow this, move up the, the, the ladder. We're going to start with some scorecards, and Todd and I are going to demonstrate these scorecards with you. We're going to start the Reward the Right Stuff program, this idea that if you know where you stand and you perform to you know, the standards of performance here, you've got a rocking great job. Should you exceed the standards of performance, there's a sweetener in it for you. You get a bonus. That's the overall intention. So to get the baseline, we're going to start keeping score, and we're going to start keeping score with the service techs, commercial and residential, and the installers, and the salespeople are already keeping score. We're not going to talk about the salespeople scorecards in this meeting, although you know Mike is going to follow up with some stuff afterwards and Dave about some refining the scorecards that you do. But in this meeting today, and starting on Monday, we're going to kick off the scorecards for service techs and installers. Now, we invited everybody to this meeting because even though this may not directly impact, like the office team, for instance, <coughs> one is I don't like to have this be a ministry. We want to share what's going on. You can't do everything at once. We wanted to really you know, um, open this up to discussion and leave some room for questions. You guys are also going to have some accounting functions, you know, as far as scorekeeping goes. It's going to be easy at first because initially, y'all are going to keep your own score. We're going to make it really simple. We're just going to do a manual scorecard. One other thing I do want to say, uh, just let you know, for every piece of paper that I bring and we add another system, I'd love to see two of them go away. So as we trot these scorecards out, I want you to be on the lookout for like, why do we write it here and here? Do we have to double entry? So you guys help me with that, because I don't know all the systems or all the paperwork that you get into, but I always feel a little guilty trotting out yet another piece of paper, right? So the basic game, I'm going to talk about the basic game for the installers first. And um, let's do that. And then, um, Dave, for sure, yes, let's do that. Now we're going to hand these out to everybody, just so you can all see the games that the, the installers are going to play. I'm going to give you a brief um, explanation of the scorecard and of the game. And starting Monday, your individual branch managers are going to learn alongside with you. Okay, all right, so John, 
know, where, you know, let's say you're, you're a, a true <coughs> technician, you're in training in the labs, you're not going to leave that debt. You're not going to get credit for the sale, but part of meeting that goal um, and the goal of getting these bonuses. So, so the, the install line is all about the production, right? You, the installers don't ask Mrs. Fernandez for the signature, the salespeople do. So the installer scorecard is all about can we bring it in at under bid and, and under, under budget or at least meet budget. <coughs> so you can see what it's measuring. You see across the top, is everybody pretty cool with it? You guys ultimately will have a moment. The idea is we're not kicking this in now. I've got to make sure we say this. We're not changing the way you pay, we pay today. Nothing's changing in your paycheck today. We're going to start tracking first. Yes, and in between now and when we do change the way we pay, we'll probably, we are going to, and you guys can help with this too, test. It, it, would this guy make the same as this? Nobody's moving down the ladder. That's, that's one of the rules we have for and we kick this up. Nobody's moving down the ladder. So that's good too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the installers, if, if you do bring it in at or below bid, there can be a little sweetener that the, the salesperson would build into the job that is released to the install team for job well done. Right, so that's where a bonus could come from. And there are some other opportunities there. Should you beat budget, we may take the difference in labor and maybe use that as a measurement. That's a little more complicated and not as attractive from an accounting standpoint, so we have some idea. Okay, So, All right. So in the simplest form, we're, we're gonna take the estimate that's created from the salesperson in the workbook, and that creates a job folder. And at this Get It Done meeting, we're gonna analyze that job folder and fill in the stuff. You know, what's the materials bid? Um, we're going to track it. Material dollars in. Labor labor hours bid in sheet metal. Labor hours in. Labor hours bid in piping. Labor hours in. And, and then compile the total labor to see if we manage labor properly. Um, subs. Subs are a big part of victory. You know, we, we, we do a lot of sub work. So it's good to know how they fit into the puzzle. Um, equipment. Sub equipment. And lists. Uh, anything we need to rent. That kind of stuff. That's part of the argument. Uh, the job completed, uh, complete install manager, sign in date, which is where John comes into play. Um, and then jobs complete at or below budget, 30 days to date, and then a bonus opportunity. I visited a company in Maine, uh, a bunch of us went there, called uh, Pine State Mechanical. We've been through this. And th their story is much different. They were going broke. They were, they were going to close their doors. And then they invested into this program. There, on their wall, is something similar to this, but it's they went green and they went red. And there was a feeling from all the installers that you went green, we went, you went red, why? And these get it done meetings were very powerful because it, 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 it cut all the um, finger, finger pointing, pointing and, and, and that kind of stuff to open it up and become better. You know, maybe the estimate's low. Maybe we're not enough. Maybe the market's tight and we're bidding it low. We, we know up front that we gotta, we got to hustle this job. The margin's low. You know, but it's all about how the comp the comp first off, the customer needs to win, the company needs to win, and then we win. So it's all about going green, and that's how this is going to develop. And you'll see these, you'll see this even bigger on the wall in here. And John, you can write it down, you guys will be gathered on it, and probably wrap each other. Hey. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to get to the next one, but you, you get this, so you're in good hands. All right, that was really great. I mean, your understanding is good. John will work out the details. Guys, I'll be available when they take off, but that was really amazing. Quick question. Yeah. Good job. Okay, so. Quick question. Yes. Um, is this going to be for every, like, the service tax? If you're a Every job? Oh, no, we got to do these? This is for install jobs. No, I know, but like, if we're going to do the scorecard for service technicians, so are we going to do this every job? Please? we got another scorecard for service yeah. technicians. Yeah, another piece of paper. This That's one's for VHA yeah, installation work. There's a separate scorecard for service Now, if you are a service tech who's wearing the install hat today, right, then you put on the install hat, and you're, your score would be going up. So mm -hmm. you but there will be one person per install job whose responsibility it is to fill out the scorecard at, at that weekly meeting, right? To just keep track. This is a job I'm going to keep track of. On a small job, you're going to be the lead tech. John's going to help assign that and empower you to do that. And then if you're not the lead tech on that job, you're off the hook for the scorekeeping on the install job. Okay? Right now, for now, we're not paying off of this yet. It's manual. We just want you to see what's coming from the, from the office. 
Okay, now we're going to shift gears. We really want to get you out of here on time, and I apologize if we're going to short shift for questions, and you're going to have them, and that's cool. Monday is going to start the process of teaching you how to fill out the score cards. On the service tech side, while we spell this out, the install game is really quite straightforward. I don't think you're going to have a lot of hiccups on that. The, is the service tech scorecard is probably going to have a few more nuances. Okay. Just don't fill in your golf card like Don Fleck. <laughs> he says he got a three, but normally it's a six. Oh. Oh. He's never seen an eight in his life. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that brings up something, and it is serious, too. Let me just say this before I have you demonstrate this. There is a lot of honor system in this game, but based on the values of the owners and based on the, the, um, the fact that they magnetize you to this family, how many of you like that taught? Talk is not concerned right out of, out of the gate. This is not a sales at any cost program. Like, he made sure that I knew the culture here, right? We get that. Also, this is a lie, cheat, or steal on this, and it's over. Game over. you got to go. You can't be here. You've got to tell the truth on this. And sometimes you won't know how you're supposed to record it. Okay, I started it. Somebody got hit by a bullet. Then this guy came in. How do we record that on the scorecard? That's... That's legitimate, and those kind of questions. But if anybody would ever fudge on a scorecard, we can't help you. We don't care what the score is. The juice, and may I address the, the branch managers at this, the juice of this game is that good guys are, who are already rocking it, kicking good sales numbers, great on productivity, thank you. Just don't cause anybody to compromise their integrity, and we'll kiss you on the lips, right? But if you're struggling, the promise is, we're going to help you, the training center. This is where you got to track, you got to train, otherwise it's me. So you've got to tell the truth, you've got to put the, the right score on there, and if you're not winning, our commitment is to help you win. Did you get that? So a willing, basically capable guy, that's where our goals are going to come from. We're not going to set goals that only a superstar can achieve. We want a good guy doing the right thing for customers, and my belief, and Todd shares this, we all do, is that the sales will come. Sales will be just fine when you do the right thing and you know what you're doing and you're a nice person. Okay? Fair enough. So now on the service tech side, this is a scorecard for you. All right? For you. So go ahead and, and take it away. I'll keep turning. Well, first off, like, we're giving you these forms. It doesn't end here. This is, don't, this is not like in the past where you give me this form and say, go nuts. <laughs> This okay. is the very beginning. We're going to train you individually, not as, a, not as a team, really belly to belly. We're going to go over this as it happens and learn together. This is this is new to everyone, the guys in the measurement, the, the, our customers, you. So we're going to evolve. Your customers do not fill out this card. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new concept. Wow. Um, <laughs> see how that works out for you. See how that works out. All right, all you want. The first two, the first yeah. two columns are number of calls and number of calls closed. Now, what that means is, is we're looking at this to, to, to look at if we're burning two calls. If guys have eight on this, ten on this, that's not good. That means we're, we're, we're just doing, say, minimum service charges. We're, we're running through the calls. If you guys notice, I know we're slower now, but we're changing our philosophy of less calls, finishing it that day, following up either the next day holding it that day, we want to do less calls with a higher average ticket um, with good margin. So the number of calls you run versus the number of calls you, you close, the actual close rate, we'll analyze that, you'll see trends of, of good and bad and what's different. You may be on a PM that day where, where it's, at, it's making your close, close rate look too good because it's a bunch of little maintenances. Well, we look at it and say, well, this is why. You, know, you may have done five residential PMs that day. It's five for five. Well, he's blown through calls. Not really. They're a little hour and a half. We want to analyze that. Um, actual sales, <coughs> that's huge. You know, um, we're going to have sales goals. Um, individual sales goals, team sales goals, and company sales goals. Um, and I want you to care about it. And Chris's office, his team has been doing it for a while where it's, they're involved with the sales. They're all sales. Right behind his desk is a board and has a sales number that's there. In Eddie's office, he's had a board that, just like me, we've tried all sorts of different measuring over the years. Um, we want everyone, we want all teams to have the same measuring step that then ties to the budget. Um, plus or minus sales goal, so actual sales versus goal. We don't know this now, so we 
we're going to measure and then apply it to the goal. Um, your average invoice, that, that's just a math based on the number of calls, the number of sales. Um, we are writing this down. And then wages as a percentage of sales, we decide to go a yes or no on this. Yeah, and I'll, I'll explain that one if you like. Sure. When we, mm -hmm. look, in fact, can I take sure, sure. right there? Okay, wages paid as a percentage of sales. That is a productivity factor. Let me tell you why we measure something like that. We could have somebody who makes really great sales, but they take a really long time to do it, <coughs> a lot of overtime to do it. We, we need to know if that's happening. So if, if that is happening, is it an organizational problem, is it a technical training problem, and fix that. The challenge is, how many of you are of the opinion that we're not supposed to talk about what somebody makes? Like, that's private information. How many of you relate to that? All right, so I'm sensitive to that. And so for now, what we're going to do is, and, and uh, Todd will help you get the details on this, but if you make uh, 20 bucks an hour and you work eight hours that day, it's $160. And you would divide that by the, the sales you have for the day. And if you're under... I think we're using 20%? Yes. 20%, mm -hmm. then it's a yes, I was under 20%, or it's a no, I was over. And that's going to be just a qualifier for us to be able to see if we've got the kind of production that's going to match our overarching budget for the company. Okay? Now, let me just take a poll. If on the organizational chart, kind of to junior tech, junior tech to senior tech, senior tech level one, level two, we're playing with this right now, then how many of you would be amenable to knowing? how much you get paid at each level, and what it would take to move to the next level. How many of you would find that to be a good thing? Right? Give me a raise. These guys, because we were talking about this yesterday. All right, that's what we're working on. Now, no one's going to move down the ladder, and sometimes it sucks to be you, but sometimes it's good to be you, because in this room, as we make decisions as to who and we, these guys, the branch managers, are going to be all over this. This is going to be a, a, a group decision as far as where we're going to put guys on the on the salary ladder, but the intention is no one's going to, be, going to get paid less on a base pay. What we are going to require is that if you have been grand, we're calling it grandfathered in, you've been grandfathered in, say a senior tech level one, because we're developing this training and this training center in the Victory Way, you're going to be required to do the apprentice to junior tech training, the junior tech to senior tech training, etc. Because we want anyone who has a mind to and the capacity for it and the ambition for it to ultimately see, could I keep moving up the ladder at victory? And one of the challenges for the old farts over there who see the expansion of the company as a good thing is that that branch manager position, the company could expand along those lines. You see what I mean? So you would be training to be a branch manager by virtue of having your job. Now, if there's not room for another branch manager, that position is not available. But the intention is, if you intend to grow that way, you really could say, anybody, and this is what we were saying earlier, could be a woman who moves up the ranks here, right? But if you so desire, what does it take to move up the ladder at Victory is something I'd like these guys to be able to answer. Doesn't mean a position's always available, but that, that's, I just wanted to take that little segue on the, on the way to pay. Mm -hmm. Because while right now it's not going to be visible, our intention is to clean this up so that it is really clear and fair as far as what it takes <coughs> to move up the ladder here, and that will become less of a, a, um, a sensitive spot. Did I explain that very well? Yeah. Are you guys cool with that? Okay. All right. So. And the last two columns is you see the word spiff. You probably have seen my spiff check. <laughs> that she liked what she, there was too many choices. So under Ellen's program, it's, there's a, there's a spiff one, spiff two, meaning the value. So let's say it's toilet month. Then that would be spiff one. And then maybe humidifiers would come to play or whatever we're trying to upsell. That's a spiff. <coughs> a similar program will be spiff check but modified to level one, level two. And that's basically it. That is basically it. Todd, you really got it. I'm really impressed with that. Now, what will happen in the next few days is there's going to be rules of the game. There are a couple of rules of the game. If you're the guy who sells it on this on the service tech side, if you're the guy who sells it, you're going to get credit for the sale. Even if, like, suppose you sell it at 11.30 p.m. and she says, can you come back tomorrow and install it? And tomorrow you're leaving for Italy. Okay? 
if you sell it, you're going to get credit for the sale, and one of your compatriots is going to do the work the next day, you wouldn't get credit for the sale. It would suck to be you today on your scorecard for that day, but you're helping a brother out. And the branch managers and the dispatch have to work together to make sure it doesn't happen to you every day. You see what I'm saying? That we have to work together to make sure that the, the opportunities are distributed, and this is how I like to say it, in an equally unfair way. In, you know? I wish that the installer's game is really straightforward. I really don't think you're going to have a lot of hiccups. This one, there are going to be some rules. So if you have a question, Write it on your scorecard. Write it on the back of, of your notepad. You know, I bring your notepad with me to write stuff down. Bring it up at the meetings, um, and uh, you know, we'll gather them. And then we'll probably have a Charlie's Angel speakerphone meeting, where I'm on the speakerphone, and I can help answer questions. But you know what? I know you'll figure it out. I know you'll figure it out. You can. You just, you know, it's a blooming thing. We won't even make a rule about it. It's just a meeting today. Or, you know, this happens all the time. We've got to address this operation here with a rule that's going to make it equally important. Okay, we're pretty good on time. What do I have here? It's 8.30. We did good. Okay, now, we did not give you a chance to answer, to ask, answer any questions. Is it? You know, you, you probably got some. So, can we ask one or two? Yeah, no, let's let's give them, let's let's take another five okay, minutes or so. Do you want to do that? Yeah, okay. We can we can do that. We have flexibility. Yeah, yeah, if anybody if anybody has some really burning reason. questions, you know, yeah, it's a I good time to bring. The, the you know, I know this is the community <coughs> area that we go to. Who's going to track that then for the like, um, so if the CEO's leads going in? We're not going to have that on our scorecard if we don't know if it's being generated by the DSR or the work orders. On, okay, so if you if you go on a call and you're going to write you're going to mark call run, you show up at the door. This is one of the rules that we might want to share too. You go on the call, you're going to mark a call run. If all that you do there is a minimum service fee, we're not going to count it as a call closed. If you go, what's our minimum service fee? Do we have one? Eighty nine dollars. That's not going to count as a call closed. And you know, I tell you, those minimum service fees we want to pay attention mm -hmm. to because why did they say no? Mm -hmm. You know, right. you know, those are something that it's usually the small dollar amounts that make me a little more nervous mm -hmm. in terms of the customer care. But it's not going to count as a call run. It's going to be right, call close, call run, call close. You didn't make the sale, but the eighty nine dollars would be recorded on your actual sales. Report. All right. Now, suppose you go on the, the call the next day and Josh sold it the day before. We're going to call it a call run or call close just so it doesn't mess up your close rate. You're not going to be penalized on a close rate uh, um, opportunity. That's good, but we have to all do it the same way. That's the rule of the game. Call run, call close, even though you didn't call or sell anything, just so it doesn't screw up your percentage. But on the actual sale is where you're going to get nicked because you won't have a sale he made it unless you sell something additional. And then it would be on your But that's but, uh, like if you put in a sales lead though, and you don't know, like the quote's still going to be on your And it's question. a week later that the actual job gets done, but you put the sales lead in a week ago. You don't know when that's going to get done. How the do you sales leads, the turnover, you mean to like a, a system engineer? Yeah. Okay, those, we're going to call either a SPIF 1 or a SPIF 2. And that lead, your scorecard, the, the um, system engineer scorecard you saw yesterday, does have a place for them to acknowledge who the lead was, and this is how we're going to connect it to payroll. We're going to track it the same way <laughs> yeah. on, on you turning the sales lead that turns to an install job, same way we're doing right now. But if it isn't an install job, what do you We're going to train you so that you sell the field more often than not, with the help of Eddie, myself, DSR. You know, book your people. I want you to, to sell it, to, to, to close it, to be involved in that process. You'll know what the sale is. Maybe you'll go to a to, to get fax to or, or email to a, someone on a corporate that it may not sell today, but but you know what the value is. Todd, I think you I think, can I just interrupt real quick? I think one of the things that Joe is talking about is that let's say he sells a circulator assembly yeah. today, and we know it's not going to come in for seven days mm -hmm. because you sold it, Joe. You're gonna it might be somebody else that may install it because you don't have the time to do it on a gets credit. Well, y'all getting credit for the sale. Remember how we were But how, who's tracking that? Like, you, like, what, like yeah. how, who's going to notify us that it was done and completed well, that we're going to get that? You know what I mean? If, if we didn't actually do the installation, mm -hmm. is somebody going to notify us 
that hey, this job was completed. So, yes. you know, so we can jar it. Who's, yeah. Who is that that's going to tell us that that was? Eddie, myself, DSR. We're going to be. There's a lot more communication. Well, isn't like say if Scott Kramer puts it in, he's going to have his. You're going to fill out this, and then you're actually going to say zero sales. But if I, I, unless I talk to sales. Scott and he yeah. tells me he did the job, yeah. how am I going to know that I did that the well, job? Let me bring this up. You're going to trust us. If, what we do is, <laughs> you guys, we're going to start with the easy ones first, and then we'll figure out the other ones. But the easy, let me, so let me tell you what an easy one would be. If I get the signature on the job, that is like the trigger that it's the yeah. sale. So whoever gets the signature gets the sale. So that's one of the ways. Even if it doesn't get collected mm -hmm. till, you know, the, or, or booked until it comes in as complete. But the signature is the clearest way to assign a sale with the paper. Which is fine with residential stuff. But right. commercial jobs, you can't get a signature sometimes because the, the decision making process doesn't get done there. Right. Now, this, is, this, is, this right. is where I got to give a little mm -hmm. philosophy. Well, I, this happens, like I was telling these guys, this happens every time. Because what you guys are are troubleshooters. So I'm bringing out a program that has a lot of holes in it, and there's some really good stuff in it. And what we're counting on you is to find every hole in it. But the danger is...